New details about China's mass quarantine strategy take a turn. Some quarantine cells don't even have beds, forcing seniors and a young mother with a toddler to sit upright all night. A growing number of Chinese residents say their contact tracing health codes are malfunctioning, showing a clean bill of health one minute and then signs of possible infection minutes later. As China battles its latest Delta-driven virus outbreak, another deadly disease is discovered in the country, with a fatality rate over 80 percent. It's the disease's first human infection in China in 10 years. And a Chinese court upholds a Canadian man's death sentence, while in Canada, lawyers make a final push to prevent a Chinese woman from being extradited to the U.S. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. China's quarantine facilities and strict lockdowns are shown to be poorly organized, and people are treated badly. In China, when one person tests positive for the CCP virus, it's common practice for hundreds of people who had been in contact with them to be taken from their homes and quarantined in facilities, such as hotels or school dorms. A video surfaced on Tuesday, showing a woman's voice message in a group message chat. She says she doesn't have anything to eat at all. She adds that even in jail, prisoners should have meals. It turns out the woman has been quarantined in a hotel in Changde city of central China's Hunan province. We interviewed a Mr. Hen who has been under quarantine in the same hotel as this woman. He told us over the weekend about 500 people were brought there for quarantine. He said there was not enough food. Many people couldn't get anything. The woman in the video was one of them. There are too many people. We distributed the food from the top to the bottom in the building. The woman seems to be on the sixth floor. Food was running out upstairs. She shouted that she had no food to eat and she's hungry and people are not allowed to go out shopping. At the time, the temperature was over 90 degrees or 30 degrees Celsius. Mr. Han said they didn't get any water when they first came. I told some responsible person at the CDC. They gave us a bottle of water in the morning. The air conditioner was turned off and it was getting hotter and hotter. I again went to the staff. They gave us another bottle of water in the evening. He later told us the situation was improving. Another video from Monday shows an unknown quarantine site in horrible condition. The quarantine cells are like narrow cages. Seniors over 80 years old have to sit on a stool, and a young mother holding a two-year-old baby sits on the floor. They have been like this for over 10 hours overnight. A commentator tries to explain why. Relying on administrative means to solve medical problems that will inevitably lead to humanitarian disasters. Another comment shows sympathy. In the eyes of the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese people are inferior to pigs and dogs. The sight of the old man, this woman and her child, makes me sad. And in Hubei province, the authorities declared a district in Jingmen City mid-risk after confirming a case of the CCP virus there. Residents and visitors were suddenly forbidden to leave. Mr. Yu works in construction. His team of nine employees were stuck in lockdown during their business trip there. Mr. Yu tells the Epoch Times the quarantine site is a middle school dorm and there are no quilts. There's no hot water, no AC, and there's a severe lack of daily necessities and disinfection supplies. He said the authorities haven't told them when their quarantine will end. Some Chinese citizens have noticed an unusual change. Their health codes, used for contact tracing and vaccination records, have suddenly gone from showing clean bills of health to possible infections. That's despite many of them receiving negative virus test results amid a new round of mass testing. Reports from southern China say a health tracking app is going wild. That's according to users from China's Hunan province. The app displays a color-coded e-passport, known as the user's health code. Green code holders are considered healthy. Yellow means the holder came in direct or indirect contact with a confirmed COVID-19 patient. It also means restricted mobility for the user, and that testing or isolation for medical observations may be needed. Red is even worse, indicating that the holder should be sent to hospital for further checks. 
In cities that have adopted the contract tracing system, only those with green codes can use public transportation and enter shops and stores. But according to Chinese media Sohu, something strange happened to one Hunan resident last week. Ms. Chen's health code was green when she came back from a neighboring grocery store, but showed red just minutes later, seemingly without cause. She noticed the change when she went to her community's entrance to meet her husband. Another resident from Hunan province told the Epoch Times that many in the area found similar issues. He asked not to reveal his voice in order to protect his identity. Instead, we used the voice actor to recreate his statement. Many people find it bizarre. They stayed at home for days and went nowhere, but their health code suddenly turned yellow or red. This really harms them. They are also afraid, and it caused a lot of discontent among local people. According to local regulations, once a person's cold turns yellow, they must get tested for the virus twice in the span of three days and quarantine for 14 days. They're also blocked from going to work until the cold turns green again. A yellow cold means your mobility is limited, and a red cold means they'll drag you to the hospital. I saw in group chat that some people collapse when their cold turned red. They immediately fell on the group and burst into tears. It was impossible for them to control their emotions. The unusual reports didn't stop there. Virus testing later proved many of those whose colds had changed had not been sickened. But later, after some tests, it was found that many aren't infected with the virus. So authorities' management of the pandemic is in chaos. This has aroused strong voices of discontent. For now, residents in the province are gathering in large crowds and taking round-the-clock virus tests. A prominent Chinese virologist is casting doubt over Beijing's abilities to quell the pandemic. The virologist recently said China needs to learn to coexist with the virus. The remarks also undermine China's claims of low virus cases across the country. NTD's Don Ma has more. A prominent Chinese virologist is voicing his opinion, which goes against Beijing's pandemic narratives. Dr. Zhang Wenhong is a household name in China. Some have even compared him to Dr. Anthony Fauci of the U.S. Zhang is also the director of the Department of Infectious Diseases of Huashan Hospital. Recently, he made a post on Chinese social media platform Weibo saying that China needs to learn to coexist with the virus. He has nearly 4 million followers on the platform. The remark directly undermines China's self-proclaimed pandemic prevention results because Beijing has always touted its low virus numbers. Beijing stands behind the strategy of wanting to completely eliminate the virus within China. But Zhang says the data shows that even if everyone gets vaccinated, COVID-19 will still spread. But the transmission rate and fatalities will be reduced. The remark sparked a storm of discussions among netizens. Some showed anger at Zhang for speaking against Beijing's narrative, while some say they think he is telling the truth. One netizen said Dr. Zhang is becoming more dangerous because he is speaking too much truth. Another says Zhang Wenhong is saying you can't rely on the government. We have to look for other ways. Zhang's Weibo post quickly received an official rebuke. China's former health minister Gao Qiang replied via the CCP's mouthpiece People's Daily. Towing the party line, Gao said it's definitely not feasible to coexist with the virus in China. Gao called for a total elimination of the virus through mass vaccinations and tough pandemic control measures. Zhang's remark that China should learn to coexist with the virus comes after an outbreak in Jiangsu province. The outbreak has since spread to more than half of China, as many new local cases continue to appear. Don Ma, NTD News. Chinese citizens are getting nervous after a Monday report from health officials, but not because of the Delta variant. Four days ago, a patient from an autonomous county in China was rushed to a hospital in Beijing. Doctors discovered the patient had contracted a deadly infectious disease called pulmonary anthrax. It's China's first case of human anthrax infection in 10 years. Anthrax is usually found in cattle and sheep. Human infection can happen after contact with sick animals or contaminated products. The most dangerous form of the infection is pulmonary anthrax, caused by inhaling droplets or dust containing the bacterium. It has a fatality rate of over 80 percent. Those infected develop flu-like symptoms, like a sore throat, mild fever, and fatigue. That worsens into shortness of breath and even death.
According to the report from Chinese health officials, the patient has a history of contact with local cattle and sheep and came to Beijing for medical treatment four days after symptoms developed. The patient is currently under isolated treatment at the hospital. Anthrax can be transmitted directly between people but isn't as infectious as the flu or COVID-19. Authorities have implemented measures to control the spread of the disease. The last patient diagnosed with pulmonary anthrax in China died in 2011. The Chinese regime's clampdown on its education sector continues, and not just in the tutoring industry. Private schools are also being targeted, all as the Communist Party seeks tighter control over its people. NTD's Penny Zhou reports. The Chinese regime is now targeting private schools. Authorities from some of the nation's most populous provinces say they will cap the number of students going to private, primary and secondary schools to below 5 percent in the next two to three years. That's by not issuing permits to new private schools or allowing existing schools to expand. The move comes as the Chinese Communist Party strengthens its ideological control forcing students to learn so-called Xi Jinping thought as a mandatory course. The term refers to the communist leader's ideology. The regime is also stopping and clamping down on private tutoring outside of school. About 15 percent of students in China get a private education. That includes those going to elite international schools, as well as the children of China's migrant workers who don't have access to local public schools. Whereas 25 percent of all schools in the U.S. are private. Meanwhile, in China, state-controlled media are publicizing cases where private schools are donating their schools to the public system. State media claims the donations are voluntary. That includes some of the best-performing schools. Such donations remind some Chinese Internet users of the CCP's campaign in the 1950s to seize all private companies, part of their crusade to establish a socialist economy. No privately owned firms remained in 1955. There are other practical reasons that Chinese authorities are targeting private schools. They say many of these schools are expensive and officials are aiming to reduce the burden of education costs on parents. This as the regime faces a looming population crisis and workforce shortage. Beijing has loosened its one-child policy to allow the families to have three children. But the heavy costs of education in China discourages many from following the officials' calls. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Chinese authorities mean business when they say after-school education should go. In this video, police from Anhui province broke into a private tutoring classroom, grabbed the tutor and shoved him out. The video caused controversy online. Some Chinese netizens are angry at the police violence in front of minors. Authorities say the tutoring violates their COVID safety measures because too many students were gathered together and not all of them wore a mask. But some netizens pointed out that the police themselves also weren't wearing masks. Other displays of Beijing's resolve to curb private tutoring appears in this picture. It shows how in a matter of days, nearly all signboards for private tutoring centers in the building were removed. The regime has stopped granting new licenses to tutoring institutions and forced them to operate as nonprofits. Several provinces have completely banned all online and offline tutoring to students up to the ninth grade. These moves are putting the over $100 billion industry at stake, as well as billions of dollars of investors' money. A Chinese court upheld on Tuesday a Canadian man's death sentence as punishment for drug smuggling. The court's decision comes as lawyers in Canada make a final push to prevent a Chinese woman from being extradited to the U.S. Meng Wenzhou is the chief financial officer of Chinese telecom giant Huawei. Here's more. A Chinese court on Tuesday upheld a Canadian man's death sentence for drug smuggling. Robert Schellenberg was arrested in 2014 and initially sentenced to 15 years in jail. He appealed, but a court in the city of Dalian sentenced him to death in January 2019. The timing of that decision is seen as critical, with some saying that it's linked to another case in Canada. A month before Schellenberg was given his death sentence in China, an executive of Chinese telecom giant Huawei was arrested in Vancouver on a warrant from the United States. Meng Wanzhou is accused of misleading HSBC about Huawei's business dealings in Iran, potentially causing the bank to violate American economic sanctions. 
This week, her lawyers are making a final push to prevent her extradition to the US. The Canadian ambassador to China, Dominic Barton, said it was no coincidence that the cases were happening at the same time. He also made reference to another Canadian, businessman Michael Spava, who was detained in China days after Meng's arrest. Spava was charged with espionage in June last year, and a court is due to announce a verdict on his case this week. China has rejected the suggestion the cases of the Canadians in China are linked to Meng's case in Canada. China has, however, warned of unspecified consequences if Meng is not released. Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs said in a statement that the country strongly condemns China's decision to uphold the sentence death penalty for Schellenberg. At a UN security meeting on Monday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called out China's apparent bullying tactics in the South China Sea. The comment sparked a strong rebuke from Beijing. Blinken says in the South China Sea, we have seen dangerous encounters between vessels at sea and provocative actions to advance unlawful maritime claims. He added that the U.S. is concerned about actions that intimidate and bully other states. China sent back its own remarks. China's ambassador to the U.N. described the U.S. as unqualified to make remarks concerning the South China Sea and calling the U.S. the biggest threat to peace and stability in the region. China considers around 90 percent of the South China Sea as its own territory and has often intruded on waters claimed by other nations. In one case earlier this year, over 200 Chinese ships sailed into the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. Blinken says Beijing's actions in the region are a problem that everyone should be concerned about. What's more, when a state faces no consequences for ignoring these rules, it fuels greater impunity and instability everywhere. China's sweeping claims to the South China Sea have been deemed unlawful. A 2016 international tribunal rejected them, saying that Beijing's territorial claims were inconsistent with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Data security risks and censorship criticism about TikTok have been growing since last year, but they haven't seemed to stop the video sharing app. On Monday, a report from Nikkei Asia showed TikTok was the world's most downloaded app in 2020, overtaking Facebook. Facebook and its sister apps, such as Instagram, made up the rest of the top five. Chinese company ByteDance launched the international version of TikTok in 2017. TikTok has since gained nearly 100 million monthly active users in the U.S. But the app's ties to China are raising concerns over whether its parent company would give U.S. user data to the Chinese regime. Former President Trump signed an executive order last summer to block TikTok from app stores in the U.S. TikTok sued the federal government over the ban. In June, President Biden withdrew Trump's executive orders to ban certain Chinese apps, including TikTok. Instead, Biden ordered a new review of security concerns linked to the mobile apps and directed the Commerce Department to monitor them. French carmaker Renault SA said on Monday it is looking to revive business in China. The company wants to form a hybrid vehicle joint venture with a Chinese brand. That's a year after it ended its previous operation in the world's largest car market. Jason Albano reports. French carmaker Renault is eyeing a return to the world's largest car market, China. Renault ended its previous operations there just a year ago. But on Monday, the company said it signed an early agreement with China-based carmaker Geely to produce and sell hybrid cars in the country. In the new joint venture, Renault will produce its brand of petrol electric cars with Geely's technology, supply chains and existing factories. Those cars are more fuel efficient than all petrol models. They're also becoming more popular as auto regulations toughen up around the world. For Renault, the deal is a chance to rebuild its presence in China after it ended a joint venture with Dongfeng Motor Group in 2020. For Geely, which is China's biggest local automaker by sales, partnering with other automakers can reduce the cost of producing cars like electric vehicles, which sources say the two are looking to develop in the future. The venture will also see Geely expanding into South Korea, a market Renault has been in for more than two decades. Partnering with another automaker is a strategy that Renault has long benefited from, with global partner Nissan. It's not immediately clear how Renault's new venture will affect its alliance with the Japanese carmaker. Two high-ranking Nissan employees told Reuters they were unaware of the new negotiations, but said Nissan could still possibly benefit from it as well.
The Times newspaper says the Chinese regime is trying to send spies to the UK by abusing a special visa scheme designed to help Hong Kongers flee persecution. NTD's Kos Temenes has the report. Chinese spies are pretending to be refugees to get into Britain. They're using a visa scheme that helps Hong Kongers escape persecution. That's according to a report by the Times. The newspaper quotes unnamed government sources, saying there are sleeper agents working for the Chinese regime, applying for British national overseas visas in Hong Kong. Benedict Rogers, chief executive of the NGO Hong Kong Watch, says the Chinese regime's alleged behavior is totally outrageous. He says the UK must tighten procedures in order to vet and screen out these spies. In response to the report, a Home Office spokesperson says there are safeguards in place throughout the application process to ensure it is free from abuse and helps those most in need. The BNO visa scheme was announced by Prime Minister Boris Johnson last July after Beijing imposed a draconian national security law on Hong Kong. It allows British National Overseas or BNO passport holders and their family members to live, work and study in the UK. Under the new law, Hong Kong authorities have banned the annual vigil for victims of the Tiananmen massacre. The government also forced the pro-democracy Apple Daily newspaper to close and arrested its editors. Last month, the first person convicted under the national security law was jailed for nine years. Critics said that the verdict set new limits on free speech in the former British colony. Many Hong Kong residents have chosen to take up the UK visa offer, leaving family and friends behind. Home Office figures show in the first quarter of this year, over 34,000 people applied for the visa. The government expects 150,000 Hong Kongers to arrive in the UK in the first year of the scheme. Cost MNS, NTD News. Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach remained silent when asked about Uyghur Muslims kept in Chinese labor camps. Beijing is set to hold the Winter Olympics next year. I know you would condemn racism. I know you'd condemn anti-Semitism. You'd condemn sexism. Are you willing to condemn the internment of Uyghur Muslims in camps in China? Steve, I think we already answered that question. We're going to come on to that. We'll I answer your you question. Answer the question. I sent you a very long and detailed answer on that only two days ago. We we're very happy to answer that when we get back to Lausanne. But this is a this is a press conference about these games, which we are heading towards the end. Gentlemen, just there, please. Yeah, your question. Thank you. China will host the Winter Olympics in February. The Chinese Communist regime has been criticized for its treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, along with many other significant human rights violations. The United Nations and rights groups estimate more than a million people have been detained in recent years in a vast system of forced labor camps in China's western Xinjiang region. The regime initially denied the camps existed, but has since admitted they do exist. It refers to them as vocational centers. In previous written statements, the Olympic Committee did not name China, but has said it recognizes that human rights need to be upheld. But it says it is powerless to change conditions. Many have called for a boycott of the Beijing Games. China started a new confrontation with a democratic country. The communist regime is demanding the European country, Lithuania, remove its ambassador in Beijing. Meanwhile, China says it will withdraw its envoy from Lithuania. This comes after Lithuania allowed Taiwan to open a de facto embassy there. China's foreign ministry says the move was the wrong decision, saying that allowing the Taiwanese embassy to open undermined China's sovereignty. China considers democratically ruled Taiwan as its own territory, despite the island having its own government and elected leader. Lithuania said China's decision was disappointing. The Lithuanian foreign minister says Lithuania will continue with its policy. The embassy will be called the Taiwanese Representative Office in Lithuania. This is the first time the island's name has been used for one of its offices in Europe. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.